Welcome to the STARS program, seniors taking active roles in society. And now, here's your host, Anita Finley. So you probably wonder what happens in those beautiful senior communities and what kind of activities uh, those residents are having. Well, typically people do play bingo and they do dance, but I have a very special guest today. And, and what he does is he actually, well, I'm going to let him tell you what he does. His name is Harry Getzoff, and Harry wrote a book called Gold. And that's with a big, that's with a little G and a big O-L-D. And he actually is an attorney who's turned senior lover. <laughs> how, how about that, Harry? Does that sound right? That's perfect. You know what? I think that is the elevator speech right there. <laughs> okay. You can use it. <laughs> so, Harry, when is it that you first decided that you were going to give up law and go into helping make the seniors understand who they are and to reminisce. Thanks, Anita. You know, this, listening to you just now, it really is a beautiful full circle story because I should make clear to the audience that I was an attorney, but I wasn't Perry Mason. I was an entertainment lawyer in the business and in the music business specifically. I grew up in a music family. My father was a songwriter who wrote great songs. You'll get the full circle part of this in a second. He wrote songs for Johnny Ray and Frank Sinatra and Keely Smith and a lot of people. Grew up in that family, and I wanted to be a manager in the music business. I wanted to manage Billy Joel, but that music was sort of shifting out of the scene by the time I got into the business. And then after working years as an entertainment lawyer in New York and managing a very big comedy act called The Jerky Boys, not The Jersey Boys, I was growing disenchanted with the music. And I had always had a love of law. I had a love of senior citizens. And that's when I started doing the interviews of senior citizens and created my project that led to a book. And trust me, you know this. I had no idea I was going to write a book. And then I wrote another book, and now I'm writing a novel. So here's the deal. I moved down to South Florida, and I started speaking about the senior citizen interviews. I've interviewed over 3,000 people, Maya Angelou, Hugh Downs, Ernest Borgnine, and the communities I was going to, you know them. Can I say who they are? Sure. Yeah, places like the Carlisle or V, Lakeside Village, or most of the five-star communities and Aston Garden. I would go and the people, I mean, I, they liked me, you know, I feel like Sally Field, you know, <laughs> and they kept asking me to come back, so I didn't panic, but I'm going, oh, my God, I have to come up with material now, like a teacher, because that's really what this is about. I'm a le- not a lecturer. I don't like using that word. So I started brainstorming, and I found a, a terrific site, the Songwriters Hall of Fame, and I go, oh, my Lord, I love talking about the music business, and my father, who passed away about six years ago, was on my shoulder. I still feel him there. I said, you know what? I'm going to talk about a different songwriter every month at these places and really go into it. History, their background, how they grew up. I can show video. I I know how to edit video, so I pull videos and photographs, and very often people start singing with me. And I don't perform. Well, I kind of perform, I suppose. And they are loving it, and that's what I've been doing. It's, it's, It's multimedia stimulating. It's fun for me. It's fun for them. It's just the perfect match in a lot of ways. And that's the full soul. Look what I've done. I've I've come back. And I'll just add this one line because I don't want to filibuster you. Uh-huh. <laughs> I don't think I could do. No, it's okay. <laughs> I, it really bugs me. And this is the essence of why I'm doing what I'm doing. It has always bothered me. And I hope people can relate to this. That people so often know the song. And they know who the singers are, the performers. But they have no idea who wrote the actual music or the lyrics. So that's what I'm doing. I'm giving them, it's really intellectual programming and lifelong learning is the term of art. And that's it. You know, you're so right. I don't know who wrote anything. And I'm always amazed when I go to Broadway shows and it's one particular songwriter. Oh, did he write that? Did he write that? But of course, that's important to you. But You do a lot more, though, even though you explained it. You really interact with the audience. You get them so that they're back in their youth and having so much fun. And 
and and of course you play a little piano or you sing. You yeah, are unique. Yeah. You are unique, and I think oh, that you're loving this well, as much as they love you. Well, that you know, a couple of things I'm going to say about that. Yes, um, it's a two way street, and they will often say to me, "Oh my lord, you prepare so much, you work so hard on these, and we can tell that you're passionate about it, and you can't fake that." Like when I was standing in front of audiences, and this isn't putting down any lawyers. I mean, I, I respect, obviously I'm a lawyer, but I could never feel that way talking about, you know, um, trust or wills. I, I, it just wasn't what I loved. I love talking about seniors. I love talking about music. The other thing I'll tell you, and last week or the week before, maybe it's the holiday season, it brings it out in people. I had two or three women come up to me after it was at the Horizon Club. And then the other one that happened at was at Aston Gardens. And people came up to me and they took my hand at the end of, it's an hour. And they said, Harry, I just want to make sure that you truly understand what you're doing for us here. The joy that you bring us. And, you know, I remembered to thank her for that, to receive the compliment. But I turned around and I smiled at her and I said, but you do understand that I'm having a blast. I could be having the worst day. And I come in here, and it does, it's not just the, the, again, I don't like speech. I say presentation. It's not just the presentation. I come early. I set up. I make the sounds. You know, I was a music business guy, so I make sure I'm like a, my own roadie. And then I have time to kill, you know, to kill with the people and to talk with them. And that's when I sit down at the piano a little bit, and I have a joke. I say I'm my own opening act. And then it's the after. They come up and they have questions. And so it's a good, it's a good evening. It is a form of meditation for me because it's, I'm in the moment every time I do them. And next year, I'm booked, you know, right through the end of the year. So <laughs> little would you Yeah, no, I know you're right? laughing. I, well, you've seen it grow, Anita. Right. We're friends. You know, right. Well, I have. I have. Well, I want to yeah. just comment on some things. And it's, it's really important that. Harry had a lot of opportunities to do a lot of other big things, and something kept pulling him to talk with the older adults who really wanted to share their life. And so he was making videos, and I don't know if you're still doing that, but making very special videos where he would uh, talk with the people, and he'd have them on video, and then he would add things. And, and, and a lot of people you know, could afford to do this, and some people couldn't. So he figured out this other way of just going and entertaining them and finding out about their lives, which they all want to tell people, right? Yeah, no, I'm glad you mentioned that. Thank you. I, here's the, the goal in my, in my world. I am writing a novel now, which I've never attempted to do, but no, I never attempted to write a nonfiction book either. And in order to, you know, it, I don't, I could, I've been offered jobs down here and it would take away from my ability to be able to do that kind of work. So in order, you said it, in order to be able to write the book, I have found these presentations. The presentations are a way for me to do it. And I, I totally am doing the videos. That's something, it's called My Long Story Short. And the website is actually mylongstoryshort.com and people can see what it is I do. It's an offshoot of what I did for the book when I interviewed all of these seniors from all over the country. And that, between that and the, and the speaking, it keeps me involved with the senior community. It keeps me involved with my writing. And I'm able to bring something to families. I just finished two videos for families, and I have music, and I have photographs that they give me. I actually scan them so I don't take them out of the house. So it's, it's a really nice mix. And, I, and I'll tell you, Anita, because I, I really, the seniors' issues, it, I am getting more and more in tune with, like, I ask myself the question all the time, where are we headed? Where are we headed in terms of the boomers? Where the Senior living and senior communities are going to have to undergo a change. So you add all this up by being in the senior communities and doing the speeches and by interviewing the seniors. I'm doing a kind of focus group. It's like a <laughs> It's like a giant focus group because I am soaking in so much information now about I'm hoping that our culture is looking ahead and trying to figure out some of the changes we're going to need to make in the years that come. 
have to tell you, I've been, in every issue of Boomer Times, I have been putting a an article. I've had to do it in six pieces because um, I, I have really been looking for longevity and gerontology to help the boomers and, and seniors, of course, to reimagine what aging is. And uh, Ken Dykewald, PhD, very, he's probably the most love, important, love it, love yeah, it. the most important gerontologist in the country, if not further. And he has for a long time been studying this. And so I have listened to some of his talks and now have been putting those talks into words. And I will tell you that he is changing the mindset of a lot of people where they thought they had to go into a senior community. There are other things to do. And he, and he expands on it. So I hope that you and other people are reading the columns that I've been putting in Boomer Times. Oh, they're, on they're that. wonderful. And you turn, you turn me on to Ken Dykewald. You're the one that turned me on to it. Yeah. Him. He's very special, yeah. but let's go back to you now. So, just yeah, give us okay. an idea of when you go to a senior community, how it all goes. Okay, <laughs> a day in the life of Harry J. Jeff. <laughs> right. No, what happens? What happens is I will, you know, have these scheduled, and I'll show up. I'll call the day before, and then I show up that day, and I set it up. I set up my laptop, and I have it. It's all PowerPoint, but it's not a lecture, and I want people to know that it's interactive. It's a workshop. Because invariably people share with me the songs that they remember, and but I'll pick, you know I'll give you some of the writers, and then I I introduce I do it as a quiz game, so I'll give clues, and I won't give it away, and people know me because I'll very often give out caramels or chocolates when they get it right, and I'm training my audience, and what will happen is you know the first time I do a um, the first inter- it's an introduction I don't just show up and talk about Jimmy Van Heusen. He's one of the people I cover. Or Yip Harburg, who a lot of people don't even realize wrote The Wizard of Oz and Sinine's Rainbow and Brother Can You Spare a Dime. And I'll cover Dorothy Fields and Leonard Bernstein and Pete Seeger and Burt Bacharach, who's a little more modern. I focus on Tim Pan Allen, but I do each writer in each presentation and it's different for every community every month. And so it gets to the point where people say, who are we going to be covering this month? Of course, I don't tell them because they have to guess. And involved or embedded in each presentation, I make sure I have a little bit of lecture about history and their background. I have photographs from their childhood. I have video of the great songs they wrote. I try to find the great performances. Um, I'm thinking of Cole Porter, so I've got Frank Sinatra singing, I Got You Under My Skin. And they... The, the audiences just love it because they sing along with it. I sing along with them. And then, you know, we get into discussions about it, and there's a lot of reminiscence that's going on as well. Uh, one observation, which I think your audience will get a kick out of, and I learned something about this too. I When I had Burt Bacharach and Hal David, well, I call him it's Hal David, and I did Pete Seeger, more modern writers, I don't know what I was thinking because I didn't do the math. But the audiences loved them. I mean, loved them. And for me, Burt Bacharach was extra special because I grew up with all that music, too. And then I realized, they said to me, you know, we we have a dialogue. Again, I don't stand up in front of them and just talk. We get into these long conversations. And they said, Aaron, you realize that we grew up with this music, too. And this is our children's music. So they want me to cover the Beatles and Billy Joel and Elton John. So I've watched I've been doing it off and on for a long time now. I've watched the audience make up change, and their musical taste obviously have changed as well. And I'll, I'll also mention that there are tributaries from this. That's why I like to refer to it. So next year, for instance, I'm going to be doing great television theme songs. And I'll play a little bit of the theme song. I'll go, what television show is that from? I've done it already, and it's amazing. And people love that. And then at least four of the writers who are the songwriters who I've already covered were caught up in the Red Scare, you know, the McCarthy era who act hearing. So I do an entire presentation just on how the Red Scare um, really affected the lives of a lot of great, very talented people who were blackballed. So I, I don't keep I keep them on their toes. I make sure it's a different 
It's always changing, but it's also it's all within the songwriting realm. It is amazing, isn't it? Though again, it's, it's amazing how some of the people, Harry, who probably if you started talking to them about you know where do they live and what's going on, they won't remember. But they always remember music. It's even Alzheimer's patients. Really, music is. I don't know. Do you know? And I'm going to have to research that. What is it about part of that brain that remembers music, if not the words, the the song, the lyrics? I mean, the the actual well, tune. Do you remember? I think you and I talked about this, but do you remember a Dr. Gene Cohn? Yes. He wrote a book called The Creative Age. It's it's I, I'm a member of this wonderful organization called Arts for the Aging, and also the National. I don't know what the full name, the National Center for Creative Aging. They, I, and I, I interviewed Dr. Gene Cohn. Unfortunately, he passed away. He wrote this incredibly, it's really the first scientific connection that shows that there is a connection to healthy aging and creativity. And it gets into what you just asked. It's Dr. Gene Cohn, G-E-N-E-C-O-H-E-N, and it's called The Creative Age. It's an easy book to read, actually. It's a very interesting book. It answers that question. There is an, a part of the brain. You know that Oliver Sacks was the great author of Awakenings who just passed away this year. There's this wonderful video that a lot of your audience members maybe have seen on YouTube, on Facebook, wherever it pops up, of an older African-American gentleman who's just completely, you know, suffering from, I guess, a form of dementia or... It could be over medication, who knows? But they put headphones on him with music, blues, and his eyes popped open and he started singing. Mm. And it was a miracle. It was truly a miracle. So it's an, it's an incredible connection. And I love to be part of that. You know, last week I was doing Cole Porter. Some of his lyrics are sort of risque. You know that. I mean, and even goes. Right. Time. <laughs> a lot of history involved. And I'm very careful to do that. I don't just pop right in. I give people historical context. In the first uh, presentation, I start back in the Revolutionary War, and I move through the Civil War, through John Philip Sousa, and I talk about how it is no accident that Tin Pan Alley exploded the way it did with the talent and the creative genius that came out of it. It had everything to do with the new technologies and the gramophone and the Victrola and, and God knows, and the changing times. But what's interesting is, is that people do exactly what you said. They'll hear a Cole Porter lyric or a Dorothy Fields lyric, I'm in the mood for love. And this older gentleman raised his hand. He goes, you know, that's the first time I ever had sex with a woman. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I hope I can say that, right? Of course, of course, I love that. Um, it's amazing because they, and we, I said, really? And they'll share. They open up and they talk about, you know, amazing stuff about the memories that are, and, and, you know, it's fun for me because I bring in my, I think one of the things that distinguishes it, and they've told me this, is I'm an entertainment lawyer, so I always bring in the music business. I talk about the legal conflicts that happen. I talk about royalty administration. I talk about how royalties are paid. I talk about the Copyright Act, how it came about. So I bring in my expertise as well. So it's not just pure, like, let's watch a video tonight. They really, I'm hoping they're, they're learning, you know. I'm sure they are. I could go on and you know I could go no, on. No, I know, but Harry, I really, really, you, you are extraordinary. I don't think there's anybody else doing that right now, and and I think what's really fun about this is that I'm watching you enjoying this as much as they, and that's very important because they pick up on that. Now, I do have to ask you a question: the um, is it the men or the women you think are more excited about your doing? I know the women are falling in love with you. I don't mean that. I mean the who seems to be the most enthused about what you do? Well, and you already know that the, just the numbers are mostly women in the places. I think it's the women. I think it's the women, but, you know, I just told you about the gentleman. It, I, you know what? I think it's just even. I think part of it is that it's just that there's more women than men in the audience by virtue of the demographics. But um, that's a good question. I'm, I'm quickly going through all the people. I just started with a new community, for me new, it's not new, but uh, V, Aventura, which is, they're wonderful. And I, I speak to them on Friday nights. Morse Life, um, the tradition at Morse 
I speak at on Friday nights. And I genuinely get the feeling that male or female, they look forward to coming in knowing that they're going to get an hour or more, because I'm there early, of memories. and But it's not just people showing up to remember stuff. It's not all about nostalgia. My last line, in every it's become a tagline. I'm hoping, I just did Dorothy Fields yesterday, and I will say, I'm hoping whenever you hear a Dorothy Fields song now, first of all, you'll know it's her who wrote it, and two, you'll know something about the person who wrote this song. And they say, absolutely. People have told me they've been in elevators the first song. They go, oh, this is when Harry told me about this. So, you know, it feels good. It is it. You know, there's always been a teacher inside of me, I suppose. You know, it's just coming out now, maybe. Well, Harry, do you have to do research? You don't know every single person, do you? No, no, no. No, no, no. I do a lot of work. It takes me about a month to prepare each. And I'm ha- I'm proud to say that Carlisle is actually, they were my first community, so they're the leaders. You know, I write for them. I always joke with them that they're my guinea pigs. I try things out on them. <laughs> if they work, they work. If, but they've worked. I mean, so for instance, I, I didn't know much about Hoagie Carmichael. I knew the name. But I didn't know he was a lawyer. I didn't know that he was a practicing attorney. He was a guy who his sister passed away when he was three when he was three years old because they didn't have any money and he vowed that he would never be poor again. So all throughout his life he always had a job while he was writing his you know, Stardust is one of these songs. It's it's a standard. He wrote a song Georgia on my mind, right? When he wrote it, it didn't make any money at all. It was like a cocoon. And 30 years later or 40 years later, Ray Charles has this big hit of his song, and it explodes and makes millions of dollars for him. Really? It's like he always, but his background was one of fear of being poor. So he always made sure that he was able to, you know, have that. So I read, I get from all different sources, and I make sure that what I read, I'm seeing, it's all on the web, it's all in books. It's just me pulling photographs from everywhere and finding the videos that, and I encourage, Anita, this is very important. I always encourage the audience to, number one, keep a journal. So when I talk about the great songwriters and how they wrote their lyrics, Dorothy Field says this all the time. She always carried around a book. You see something on television, you see something in public. If it triggers a thought, write it down. Write about it. And number two, I encourage people to go onto YouTube. More and more seniors are using the computer now. Very different. If I ask an audience of 150 people, how many people are using the computer? Ten years ago, maybe 25% of the audience raised their hand. It's a lot more now. The room basically raises their hand. Mm. So they can find a lot of this on their own and enjoy, you know, you're going to laugh, but I sometimes get mesmerized. I find every What's My Line episode is on YouTube. And it's fun to watch. So it's all stimulating. It's all part of that stimulating the brain and keeping it going, right? Right. Now, let me also say that I'm going to be seeing, um, and I've asked you to go see Elvis Presley. And you're going to join me. Can't wait. Can't wait. Now, my question is this. Even though he's advanced from when a lot of these seniors were, you know, in their heyday, don't they also like Elvis? Well, I think that the only person who doesn't like Elvis Presley in my life is my mother. <laughs> and Bill, my <laughs> husband. <laughs> well, she was, well, and Bill, she was two people on the face of the earth. Well, here's the reason, though, and even mom has come around now because, you know, and this gets into Johnny Mercer and Hoagie Carmichael, you know, the old Tin Pan Alley writers, and I talk about this a lot, they kind of resented the new music with the new equipment and the new recording, the new technology and the new beat. Rock and roll came in, and it kind of forced them out. And only a very few people were able able to bridge that gap. Guys like Burt Bacharach were kind of the bridge between the new and the old. And and Leonard Bernstein, I have a great interview that I showed during my presentation. He he addresses this. He was a cool. He was so cool that guy. I mean, much more than a classical conductor. You know, he wrote West Side Story and a lot of other great modern programs. But but here's the thing with Elvis. This is, I don't mean to editorialize, but his music, who's a lot of his songs were written by Lieber and Stoller. And I went to camp, I told you, with um, 
Oliver, uh, Oliver Lieber and Jeb, Jeb Lieber were friends of mine. His music compared to some of the non-melodic music today, and I'm not putting it down, I'm just saying it, is like Beethoven <laughs> compared to what you hear today. Because mm-hmm. he had Love Me Tender and Blue Christmas. I just did a holiday program for all the great holiday songs. And the older people in the audience actually said to me, why didn't you cover Blue Christmas by Elvis? Mm-hmm. So you hear this, it's almost a longing. I hear a lot of this. I have to mention people are longing for melodies again they miss new music today doesn't have um, what we call the hook my father taught me this and I grew up you know I worked in the music business for 20 years we don't have songs that I don't feel I could be the old fogey in me but I don't think it is I don't think we're we're creating songs today uh, that are going to last as popular standards I can't see it because a lot of my a lot of my friends are children. They want to hear Crosby, Stills, and Nash. They want to hear Billy Joel. They want to hear the Beatles. Stone. And They're it's interesting. Recently, in uh, I heard Carol King uh, was very popular, and she stills. I love Carol King. Amazing. Yeah. No. 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 Th- but here's the thing. This is one of the things that comes out in the presentation. Again, this is a Harry gets up observation. I don't know if. I should write something about it because I think there's something to it. I can submit it to Billboard. In the old days, I'm talking Tim Pan Alley, you had specialization of tasks. You had your really good writers and you had your really good performers. And in fact, the writers were broken down. Composers, you know, music people and lyricists. And everybody did their thing really, really well. And they collaborated. And that's what I think led to the great magic. That changed when you had Buddy Holly and the Beatles and a lot of the modern day artists who all of a sudden did it all. But you know what, Anita? Not a lot of people can really do it all. Even Irving Berlin and Cole Porter, who wrote lyrics and music, they didn't try to sing their song. And I think that may be one of the components that's leading to a lack of great music. There's no real outlet for the individual songwriters today. They, they, if they don't perform it themselves, where are they going? What are they going to do with it? You know, and mm-hmm. I think it's a problem. I do. Well, it's um, it must be fun for you because, as you said, you're researching and you've loved music, and now you're learning so much more. So, uh, Harry, it's been great talking with you. I have to tell you that uh, I can't wait to go see Elvis Presley. It's funny when Bill said he really didn't like Elvis. I said, "Don't you really want to go with me?" He said, "No." I said, "I'm taking it." Uh, Harry, and we'll talk more, and we've run out of time. And thank you so much. Happy holidays. Same to you. And if anybody's out there looking for somebody to speak to their community, I'm the guy. Bye. Thanks, Harry, so much. All right. Thanks, Anita. Happy holidays.